Um, so the title of the talk today is Music to Medicine, Not as Simple as It Sounds. Uh, I have no financial disclosures that I'm going to mention. However, I do have several musical disclosures or musical conflicts of interest, if you will. I got the BA in music at Cornell. I'm a freelance organist. I am the conductor of the North End uh, Chamber Orchestra. I'm music director of the St. Leonard Choral Society, in which many of the people, even in this room, have participated in the past. And as a little proof, right here we have a photo from our <laughs> concert, uh, not of 19, but 2018. Jeannie and Michaela both uh, played for that concert. Uh, Nada played in the year before, and Lawrence played as well. So it's um, been a lot of great work with the people in this room. So what I'm gonna first talk about, talk about is a history of music and medicine, just very briefly. Then talk a little bit about some mechanisms of music and some bio biochemical and physiological ones. Then music for obstetric anesthesia, including impacts on anxiety and patient satisfaction, and then end with the summary. So the first question I have for the group is, you know, this kind of thing people say, what type of music might be effective to decrease anxiety? Any, you know, words? Classical. Classical. That's a very, <laughs> very classic answer, right? <laughs> Classical music is gonna be great. So I'm, I actually brought in a speaker, and I'm going to play for you uh, a piece by Frederick Chopin. Has anyone heard of this musician? Yes. He wrote a lot of piano music. Um, and he wrote a lot of piano sonatas. And this is opus number 30, uh, opus 35, number two, the third movement. And I'd like you to tell me, so this is probably the definition of classical music. And I'd like you to tell me if you think that this music would decrease your anxiety if you were to listen to it, you know, let's say during a labor epidural placement. <laughs> <laughs> this is classical music. Right. Yes, this is the funeral march, very famous funeral march of Frederick Chopin. So that is classical music. So I gave that example because it's actually probably not so simple. And in a way, you know, you may have heard this, you don't know what you don't know before, right? And this is kind of to say that, you know, we still need to keep learning. In fact, music medicine is not the same thing as music therapy. If you turn on you know, some music during a case or whatever, you're actually not performing music therapy. You are just practicing music medicine, unless you have a degree in music therapy and you've actually been board certified by the Certification Board for Music Therapists. Then you can, then you can claim that you are practicing music therapy. So music you know, for patient uh, you know, therapeutic purposes is not as simple as you just play Push, push play for classical music, whatever that means, and uh, it works. It's a lot more complicated than that. So a little bit of a brief history of music and medicine going way back. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody seen this before? So this is a Roman figure from the third century, Orpheus surrounded by animals, the floor mosaic in the Antonio Salinas Regional Archaeological Museum in Palermo, Sicily, Italy. This is the Greek god, Orpheus, who was known in uh, the Odyssey to play these epodes, which were these musical spells that could cure a lot of ailments. So music has been used to treat ailments in Greek mythology. How about this? Anyone know what this painting is? Any thoughts from anybody? So this is a painting by Ernst jo Josephson. It was painted in 1878. But it's actually David and Saul, and it, this painting is in the National Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. And it actually describes essentially this Bible verse, which is the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, verse 14 to 23. So the servants of Saul said to him, Look, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. If your lordship will order it, we, your servants here attending to you, will look for a man skilled in playing the harp. When the evil spirit from God comes upon you, he will play, and you will feel better. So it's described a long time ago already in the Bible that music can be used for these therapeutic purposes. And in fact, um, in the journal Anesthesiology just a few years ago, this was published, this picture from the painkiller polka, which is something that was you know, sort of a little bit of a satire about 100 years ago. Also, it was sort of music for medicine, music for anesthesia, music has all these magical abilities, but you know, there's not a description of how it works or anything like this. 
And in fact, we do have some studies on the topic of some of the bio biochemical mechanisms of music, and so I'll review them a little bit here. This is a study I really enjoy looking at because the first author here, Claudius Conrad, he was a surgery resident in Mass so. General. Then he became he came to Brigham Women's here, and he was a uh, oncology surgical oncology fellow. And this study is entitled Overture for Growth Hormone, Requiem for Interleukin-6. It was published in Critical Care Medicine in 2007. In this, the goals of the study were to start to understand some of the mechanisms by which music may improve human well-being. And what they did is a randomized trial of patients who just had surgery, and it was a big surgery, so they uh, got out of the operating room intubated. And on post-operative day one, something like nine o'clock in the morning, they started to wean the patients of the propofol to see if the patient's ready for extubation. So for that one hour time period that they would wean the propofol, half the patients listened to some classical music, specifically second movements of piano sonatas by Mozart, and the other half did not listen to any music, and they just had headphones, and then they looked at some uh, various outcomes. And so, this is some of the music that was played. Example of Mozart sonatas. Do you feel this is a little bit maybe more potentially relaxing compared to the Chopin sonata? This is what I was thinking of. This is what you were thinking of, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So what did they find? So this is the first figure in their article. The mean arterial pressure decreased in the patients who were listening to music after one hour compared to the control group. And this line here, the gray line across the middle, the, the middle is their sort of the baseline where they started at, and the up and down in the blood pressure is essentially the relative change. Similarly, for the epinephrine levels and IL-6 levels, which are, uh, IL-6 is a potent activator of adrenal cortical uh, uh, reflex here, the levels also decreased consistent with what you might suspect as anxiety reduction, right? Decreased levels of epinephrine with music, decreased levels of IL-6. So there is definitely some sort of biochemical evidence to suggest that music does actually decrease anxiety. Are there any physiological or otherwise uh, studies? Of course there are. This is a study entitled Intensely Pleasurable Response to Music Correlate with Activity in Brain Regions Implicated in Reward and Emotion. This is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States in 2001. In this study, the authors used positron emission tomography, or PET scans, to look at the neural mechanisms in the brain of the mechanisms underlying pleasant emotional responses to music. And as you can imagine, what they found is there were certain areas of the brain that lit up, which none of us are radiologists here, so you may not understand all these different nuances, but essentially what they describe is that the same regions that lit up were the ones that would light up in a patient who might be abusing cocaine or heroin when they're having this intensely pleasurable experience from the drugs, Similar regions were, blowing, uh, were uh, coloring up in the patients who were listening to music and having a, a, a positive experience from it. So there are definitely a lot of different uh, physiological and biochemical mechanisms that can explain it. And there's an even a nice review article published in The Lancet just a few years ago in 2015 entitled Music as an Aid for Postoperative Recovery in Adults, the Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And it describes that music in 73 randomized controlled trials that were reviewed Music was reduced post-operative pain, anxiety, analgesic use, and increased patient satisfaction. They also went on to, as far to say as choice of music and timing of delir delivery made little difference to outcomes. I'm not entirely sure if I agree with that, but that's uh, another thing that they mentioned. So with all this studies and evidence going back from the Bible and, and the Greek mythology all the way up until 2015 with this Lancet article showing that music helps, it gives, you know, makes you think that maybe it would work on the obstetric uh, labor and delivery floor. So one of the questions that I had when I was a fellow and I started this was with Bhavani Kodali, who's no longer here, was can music be used for anxiety reduction during placement of a neuroxial technique for labor analgesia? Um, has anyone here since I left been using music during the epidural placement or not really? Not so much. Well, there Sometimes might be a reason for it too. Some patients What's that? do. Some patients do, yes. And, and actually, yeah, I've had patients who like want have come in with their music on their iPhone and, and ask, can you can I play music on the iPhone? And what do you say? Yeah, 
Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, I we've even yes. had people play come like the husband has a guitar or something yeah. and playing or whatever. Yeah, we've had a lot of different things like that. And so what we did is we wrote we did this study which we then published in anesthesia and allergy in 2017 entitled a randomized controlled trial music use during epidural catheter placement, laboring parturient, anxiety, pain, and satisfaction. Our goal was to, as you, as you can see, understand whether music would help while the patients are getting their epidural technique placed. And what we did was they would get either music, which was specifically at the time Pandora was very popular, it's still pretty popular I think today, and the patients could choose their own, what they felt was their most favorite and most anxiety reducing Pandora station. So someone might say classical music and then that we would choose. Someone might say rock and roll, then we choose rock and roll, whatever they said. The other half of these patients did not receive any music. So there was just nothing playing, and it was just a quiet room, and we just placed the epidural technique. And then the primary outcomes were three measures of anxiety. The first one was a VAS score, or numeric NRS score, really, from zero to 10, zero being no anxiety, 10 being the greatest. And there were these two other um, anxiety scores that we measured that are more like used in the psychology literature, which is a little bit complicated, so I won't go into those. I've just used the NRS from zero to 10 because it's easier to understand. So this is the primary outcome. The control group, after the epidural technique, had an anxiety of 1.4 plus minus 1.7. So I'd like the group to guess what, you know, your hypothesis, what do you think is gonna be the anxiety in the music group, knowing that the 1.4 in the control group? Approximately. Nice. Well, give me a number. One. Okay, so we got a one. Any, anyone going for 0.9? 0.9, going once? Point eight. Point eight. Point eight. All right, we got a point eight. Anyone going for 0.6? Point five. <laughs> We got a 0.5, any, any lower? Whoa. Zero, zero, Whoa. zero point zero, no? All right, yeah. so, we're, so, so I've heard four people say less. Any, anybody think it's gonna be five? Or, you know, 2.5. Five is like more anxiety. Yeah, zero. yeah, zero is no anxiety, 10 is the worst. Who think it's gonna go up? Two. All right, so we got one for two. All right, anybody else? So 1.4 that baseline, that seems pretty long. No, Nine. this is the after the epidural technique. After, okay. Yeah, this is after their epidural was placed, this is their anxiety, 1.4. All right, so we got one person who says two, but everyone else said less. And in fact, we had 2.9. So the anxiety appeared to increase with the epidural technique placement under music, with music. A little bit strange, not what you're expecting, right? All right, maybe that, that was a fluke. How about the patient satisfaction? So we had this very general satisfaction question. Overall, how satisfied were you with your epidural placement experience? and they could rate it as not satisfied, somewhat, moderately, or very satisfied. We here are presenting the proportion of patients who replied very satisfied. So in the control group, we had 40 patients, so 82% of the patients replied that they were very satisfied. What proportion in the music group, or are you gonna guess, said that they were very satisfied? 92. We got a 92 from Mike. 93. 93. 95. 95. All right, so everyone's saying that they're gonna be more satisfied with the music. And in fact, what we found was that it was 62% of the patients were very satisfied with their epidural technique placement. So it seems like an increase in their anxiety and they were less satisfied with the whole experience. Okay, not what we were expecting. And how about the next question? If you were to have another epidural in the future, would you want music? And it was the same kind of definitely no, maybe, you know, definitely yes. This is the proportion of patients who said definitely yes. The, there was 45% of patients who were in the control group who said definitely yes. So what do you think is gonna be in the music group? The study the control people were asked would you not want music to play because they didn't have music, right? Yes, so the control group never had music. So we, we asked, if you were to have another epidural in the future, would you want music? Now, some of them didn't have it, so you know, they, they're not basing it necessarily on anything else, but just would you want it to have music? I suppose they're basing it on the fact that they didn't have music. So what do you think is gonna be the music group? What do you think they're gonna want in the future? I think for some reason they're gonna want music. I think those all the numbers don't show. we're gonna keep. All right, so, in, so, so we got like a little bit of a thing. So in fact, 84% of the pa patients who listen to music said they would like to have it again, despite the fact that it appeared to decrease their, to increase their anxiety and decrease their patient satisfaction. So these numbers are, very strange and doesn't entirely seem to make sense. 
And I'm gonna show you some more patient satisfaction data towards the end that might help to explain some of this stuff, but keep this in the back of your mind. So music increases anxiety and decreases satisfaction during your axial technique. Is this wrong? Or, you know, was this just a, you know, our study was just totally wrong, like, or it just happens to be, you know, that it's by chance we found the wrong answer. Well, in fact, this is a study entitled The Effects of Music on Anxiety and Pain in Patients During Carotid and Arthrectomy Under Regional Anesthesia Randomized Controlled Trial, published out of Turkey in the Complementary Therapies in Medicine Journal in 2019, so just last year. And what they did is they looked at patients who were going to be listening to music under a cervical plexus block while getting their carotid. So basically they're awake for the procedure and then the surgeons or whoever else neuromon are doing neuromonitoring by basically asking them, you know, count backwards, whatever it is they do. Have you ever done this type of case? Have you heard of this uh, technique? So the patients are up, awake during surgery. So they got to choose one of the four most popular music genres in Turkey. And here are their results. So in the control group, they looked at their intraoperative anxiety, and during the surgery, the non-music group had an anxiety of 3.4. What do you think the music group had? Now you're like, I don't know. So we got a two. All right, so you think they're less anxious. We got a five, more anxious. So in fact, they were 5.5. So these patients were actually more anxious with music during their carotid endarterectomy. So now when I have this study combined with my study, now I'm beginning to think, you know, maybe these results are not totally just, it's a fluke, it's a crazy result. Maybe there is something here. So what might be the mechanism if this really is the case? Maybe music is increasing anxiety. You know, we, we were thinking, you know, Orpheus, he's got these animals around him, he's playing the harp, and they're all happy, but our patients are increasing anxiety. What's going on here? So this is, a, this is a study that might help to explain some of that. It's entitled Effect of Noise on Auditory Processing in the Operating Room, published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons, so specifically looking at surgeons. And what they did is they wanted to test the surgeon's ability to understand and repeat words under six conditions. The conditions were either quiet with the task, quiet with no task, noise with the task or no task, and music with the task or no task, meaning the task was that they had to physically be doing something and untasked was that they did not. And basically what they did is um, they rated their performance, which is on this y-axis from zero to 100%. So 100% meaning they asked them you know, a certain number of words and they could 100% of the time answer correctly, and zero is that they answered none of them correctly. And what you can see already, the red square at the very top is the quiet K, you know, the quiet scenario with no task, they're pretty much at 100%. The blue is where the surgeon's got to do something while listening. So you can see already having to do something makes them a little bit less accurate. Then when, the, when, the, when there was noise, white noise I believe it was, not specifically mu music, their performance decreases, especially in the blue line again when they're tasked. They have to do something and now there's noise. They don't hear as many things. They don't repeat it quite as well when back. And then when there's music, their performance is even worse than with noise. And so this suggests that, you know, these noise, the music, probably words also, if you're listening to a song maybe, there might be words, you might be thinking about those things. Those are kind of a distraction and they're distracting you from what you're thinking. And so I think this study suggests that maybe in the epidural study that we had, the anxiety might be increased because there's this music and the patient thinks that she has to now interact with you, right? Because you ask her, oh, did you feel it on the left or the right? And she didn't quite hear you because she was listening to the music. And now she's distracted. Now she's getting more anxious because she's got to, she feels like if I don't answer this answer, you know, answer this question right, I'm not going to get my epidural in the right spot. So she gets more anxious. And I think the same thing might be going on with the carotid endarterectomy. They got the music playing, and now they're being asked, you know, say dog, apple, cat. And they are like, oh man, but I was just listening to, you know, my heart will go on and I'm now getting distracted and I'm gonna say the wrong words. And so I do think music can be a distraction in the wrong way if not used under the right conditions. And so that's probably what's going on here. So maybe it can increase, you know, anxiety with music and, you know, and all those kind of things, but maybe music can reduce anxiety before a cesarean delivery, you know, and you know, they're just hanging out in the pre-op room and they're not actually physically having to do anything. And so that was the, another study that we did with Dr. Farber 
and we published in Journal of Maternal Fetal Neonatal Medicine in 2019, also last year, entitled The Effect of Patient-Selected or Pre-Selected Music and Anxiety During Caesarean Delivery of Randomized Controlled Trial. Specifically, what we measured as a primary outcome was the anxiety after a 30 or so minute music listening session prior to the C-section. So they're just waiting, and now they're either listening to music or they're not, and they actually had three groups. One of them got to choose their own music, was on a Pandora station. One of them was listening to this Mozart music, and then the third group was listening to nothing at all. So essentially we're using the music as a midazolam type of uh, thing. And the dose of the music was 39 minutes in each group. And here are the results from that study. The Pandora versus control group had a mean difference or decrease of anxiety of 0.8, although not, not reaching statistical significance. And our music, Mozart versus control group, had a dose reduction of anxiety by of 1.1 on a scale of 0 to 10 with a statistically significant result. So suggesting you know maybe our sample size wasn't large enough for the Pandora, or maybe Pandora doesn't work as well, but certainly with the Mozart music, it suggests that it did, did decrease anxiety in that specific situation. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, in the pre-op period, the parturient is not thinking, okay, I gotta add, you know, answer this left, right, and all that stuff. They're just sitting there relaxed and waiting for the C-section to start. And they can't get midazolam if they're anxious, right, because you don't want to affect the baby. So, the, so music might be a useful sort of midazolam substitute. We also had this patient satisfaction questionnaire with nine different questions in overall. And I won't go over the details, but question number three I thought was interesting, which did so, show statistically significant difference in the Mozart group. And this question specifically asked, did you find the operating room environment comfortable? And the Mozart seemed to make it maybe a little bit more comfortable. So maybe in the operating room it makes it uh, you know, just a little bit more comfortable and easier to deal with that situation. So music may, in, may decrease anxiety in the pre-op period having a midazolam effect. But you know, all this talk of patient satisfaction <coughs> made me wonder, does Mozart music during cesarean delivery improve patient satisfaction? And so I did another study now just at POPS um, that I'm calling sort of musical cesarean number two, in which the primary outcome was music, patient satisfaction, but we went a little bit further than just making a zero to death. This is gonna be our main outcome. So I didn't wanna be just okay, zero to 10, how satisfied are you and how, how happy are you? We want the full deal. So there is actually something called the Maternal Satisfaction Scale for Cesarean Section. It's published by Morgan and colleagues in IJOA back in 1999. And it actually assesses specifically four major domains of patient satisfaction, including interpersonal interactions, the anesthesia experience, so it says, you know, did you have pain with the needle, and those kind of things, the intra and post-operative experience, and side effects, things like, you know, were you nauseous? It's actually scored on a scale of 22 to 154, and as an example, the score, the mean and standard deviation of a elective cesarean under, under spinal is 116 on this scale. So just to give you these, you know, a general reference. So we also looked at some secondary outcomes, anxiety and mean arterial pressure, and this is what we found. Our composite patient satisfaction in the music group was 116, similar to the other study, and in the control group was 120, and we did not find a statistically significant difference in this patient satisfaction. Similarly, in anxiety, we also did not find a difference, and in mean arterial pressure, we also did not find a difference. So what may be going on here? I will explain to you what I think with, with, a, with some statistics of Brigham Women's and Tufts Medical Center. So Mozart music, you know, maybe it's not you know, improving patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction is a little bit more complicated, I think, than this. So the, is everyone aware of HCAPS? Have you ever heard of HCAPS? HCAPS is this survey that's actually sent to all the patients after, not all the patients, I think it's like a specific 10% or whatever. They send it to all the patients afterwards and it asks them several questions, it might be like four pages long, about their general interactions and some other things. And these are some of the questions from there. And it's supposed to measure the overall satisfaction and it's sometimes used to um, determine reimbursements also for, for the healthcare. And so these two questions, and, and it's actually all published on hospital compare, so medicare.gov forward slash hospital compare. I accessed this last year. And you can actually see all these answers for all the hospitals, I believe in the United States, in the entire country. So I downloaded data for Brigham Women's and Tufts Medical Center, and I'm gonna compare some, something to show you how complicated this is. 
So the first two questions, patients who gave their hospital a rating of 9 or 10 on a scale 0 to 10, or patients who reported yes, they would definitely recommend the hospital. This is a overall general satisfaction kind of question. At the Brigham, we're in the 80s. At Tufts Medical Center, we're in the 70s. So Brigham seems to have a slightly higher, you know, 9 to 10 rating. Uh, slightly more patients are recommending this hospital. However, when you start looking at the detailed questions, you know, the patients re reported that the nurses always communicated well, or that the doctors communicated well, or that they received help as soon as they wanted, or that the staff always explained the medicines, or the room and bathroom were clean, or that they understood the care, and their recovery at home was comfortable, and all this, these, these specific questions. In fact, Brigham and Tufts, the numbers are pretty much you know, the same, or one percentage point apart, you know, sometimes a little higher here, sometimes a little higher there. So none of these things could really explain the top two questions, right? Why is Brigham like five to eight points higher on these general satisfaction questions when all these general questions, specific questions at least, don't actually have much of a difference? And how about these two last questions? Percentage of patients who received appropriate care for severe sepsis or the median minutes patients waited in the ER before being admitted. This is also data you can download straight from this website. In fact, according to this website, only 45% of patients received appropriate care for sepsis at the Brigham compared to 54% at Tufts Medical Center. And the, and the ER wait at the Brigham was longer than the Tufts Medical Center ER wait. So if you were to say, okay, this is an important factor, well, certainly that didn't affect the nine or 10 rating scale and the yes, I would definitely recommend thing here. So what the purpose of this is, to, is to explain that patient satisfaction probably, when we just look at these zero to 10 scales, overall, how satisfied are you? and we see some difference, it's not entirely clear what this data even means. It might also have something to do with reputation. Probably there's a bias. You know, you're going to Harvard Hospital, you're gonna give an extra point, maybe. Maybe there's some other things going on, but it's not so simple. And so I think when we didn't find this difference in our maternal satisfaction in the C-sections, it might not be so simple as to say, well, you know, these questions are really gonna answer that question. It's, it seems to be much more complicated than that. And so some questions arise when you try to study satisfaction with music. You know, what are you trying to study? Satisfaction with what? Is it overall satisfaction from zero to 10? Is it satisfaction with the pain control, anxiety control, anxiety or, or something else, or the hospital environment? It's not so simple. So in summary, music and medicine, not as simple as it sounds. Music may be anxiolytic, but it may also increase anxiety. And, and I'm kind of going to compare this to antibiotics. Let's say, you're gonna say, what are you gonna give this patient for prophylaxis? Antibiotics. Uh, well, which ones? Well, you know, I'm gonna give some random antibiotic I've never heard of. Well, that might not actually work for the bacteria that you're trying to kill, right? So, so you need to specifically tailor the antibiosis that you're gonna give a certain patient with a certain disease so that it actually kills the bacteria. So I think music is the same thing. You have to really understand the music, you have to understand the situation, the parturients, or the patient in general, what they, what their needs are in order to be able to really tailor that. And that's really where the music therapist comes in. They have thought about this a lot. Patient satisfaction is complex. You know, there's simple scales or more complex surveys. We need to figure out how those are uh, different. And I think still many questions remain. What is the best dose of music? So that would be maybe an, uh, the duration. And can you overdose on music? You know, like if you're in the pre-op area, having a patient listen to music for 30 minutes versus three hours, Maybe at three hours, they're gonna start getting annoyed and it's not gonna decrease their anxiety anymore, which I think we did have a patient like that in one of our, <laughs> one of our patients in our study. Um, what about the delivery method? Should it be headphones? Should it be a speaker? Should it be something else? I recently did a case at Tufts where we gave patients speaker, uh, headphones and I thought, okay, it's gonna be the greatest thing. Um, he's gonna be listening to music and he couldn't get over the fact that it kind of was squeezing his ears and he just hated it and he kept wanting to take them off. So that was not decreasing anxiety at all. Um, what about patient choice? Does that matter? Should the patient choose or should we choose? Should a music therapist choose based on their expertise? Um, what about pre-op, intra-op versus post-op? Do the different time periods affect the effects of music? And the surgery type, you know, does different types of surgeries have different effects? Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate the time and I'll take any questions. I, I can't remember if there are any studies of patients under general anesthesia with music. Yes. What that exposure is. Yes, there is a study, at least one that I'm familiar with, 
that has looked at, and I can't remember the exact outcomes, I think they may have suggested there might be a little bit of improvement, but I don't remember yeah. the exact outcome. The most I've seen music therapy is like in the ICU, or they'll like play it in the rooms in the ICU. Is there good data for that? Or Well, the, the particular, the first study that I talked about, the Conrad study, that was done specifically in ICU. Okay, because that's like, in Brigham at least, that's where I've seen it the most, is like in like an ICU room, and Comparisons to that, is it harder to like when you wake up, you will like be in so and so, and I'm gonna eat table chip? You know, you know how you can yeah, 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 yeah. Is there any like uh, comparisons to music in that that other thing which seems to help people? I, I don't know the studies on what that really does, but it seems to have been promoted in the past. That's yeah. similar to the ICU study where the music was purchased when they were coming off the pill for that solution. So it was similar thing. Yeah, so like, you know, like waking up to music, like, you know, in general. So I waking up to positive words. Yeah, like, like you know, person. you will be okay, you have no pain, you will have, you know, you, you remember, I, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they like bring those in and I'm always like, I don't want to say you'll be in no pain because I can't really guarantee yeah. that, yeah. you know? Yeah, but there's some, I guess, evidence that these are the things that people yeah, like. Whether or not it truly works, I don't know. But I don't know if there's been any kind of a similar um, things for yeah. some of us. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I'm not familiar with any studies on that. Okay. I think it's kind of funny. You know, Nancy Clarman who plays the harp. Yeah. There's people that they're waking up when she's playing and they think like they're exactly. heaven. Oh yeah. Play, you know, I have patients say that to me. Especially yeah. when yeah. she yeah. plays stairway. <laughs> on yeah. the, yeah. Way, yeah. No, she does on the way to yeah. surgery, and they said. Oh my god, my tie literally said <laughs> Oh, because she's in yeah. the, he's in all, all yeah. one, like, the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, brother. That's not how I got practice. So what is your practice currently? My practice currently, I don't, so I don't routinely play music for any cases, because I think I'm still investigating, I'm still trying to figure out what's the best situation, where can we really use it best. Of course, if a patient asks for it, or, or if a patient is really anxious and we're doing a lot of things and nothing seems to be working, I'll throw it in then. But I don't do it as a routine. So I poll the patient and like ask them, you know, what their favorite music is or who their favorite artist is, and maybe tailor that, and maybe that and you know incite some more calming effect. I know with like kids, uh, when we do uh, you know mask inductions at our institution. Um, we always ask the kid, you know, what their favorite show is, and like, and that way they're like a lot more calm. They're paying attention to whatever their favorite show is, and they kind of tolerate the whole process. You know. I remember doing this, and I find it, I found it very distracting. Yeah. So I couldn't do what I wanted to do until next week. Um, and I think that was a little bit of a distraction too, because they couldn't listen to music unless you know that whole thing. Oh yeah.